Hola, bienvenidos a una nueva eh, emisión de Astrobiología para todos y todas. Nos da muchísimo gusto que nos acompañen. Esta vez estamos cambiando de plataforma. Esperamos que, <ríe> esperamos que todo salga bien, eh, sin problemas técnicos. Eh, pues el día de hoy estamos muy, muy contentos de recibir al doctor Simón Marchi, que es eh, parte del, de, eh, del staff científico de... Eh, de la Universidad de Boulder, Colorado. Eh, sus intereses cubre, cubren la formación y la geología de los planetas terrestres, la luna y los asteroides. Actualmente él es el eh, director adjunto de la, del proyecto de la misión eh, Lucy, es co-investigador de la misión Psyker, que también va a ir a otro... A otro este, a otro asteroide de la misión NASA Down, eh, de la misión de la ESA Bepi Colombo y de la eh, misión Juice de la ESA. Eh, el doctor Marchi ha ganado premios internacionales, entre ellos está el premio eh, Farinela eh, que, eh, y el, el premio Susan Mahan Neighbor eh, para eh, científicos de carrera temprana eh, por sus estudios en el impacto de, eh, perdón, en, en las historias de impacto de los planetas terrestres y los asteroides en la evolución del de sistema solar temprano. Eh, también ha sido receptor de eh, pues varios eh, premios de la NASA y de la ESA. Ha publicado un libro eh, que se llama eh, Colliding Worlds, eh, mundos en eh, en colisión con eh, la Universidad de Oxford University Press, de hecho eso fue este año, y ha eh, sido autor de más de 170 artículos eh, de, en revisión por pares. Tiene un asteroide que fue llamado en su nombre por la eh, eh, Unión Astronómica Internacional, que es el asteroide 7253 Simón March. Eh, su trabajo ha sido eh, pues regularmente pasado en las noticias, así que pues eh, nos da muchísimo gusto recibirlo. Eh, welcome, Simon, and um, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you Antigona for your kind uh, introduction mm -hmm. and also for um, having uh, me here today. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to um, talk about the NASA Lucy mission, uh, the first mission to the Trojan asteroid. My name is Simone Marquez, Southwest Research Institute, and I'm also the um, deputy uh, Lucy uh, project scientist. I would like to get started with um, a brief, um, let's see if this, yes, with a brief um, description of the mission uh, logo. Um, this is because it really conveys a number of interesting ideas that are um, all together coming to form in the logo. And I would like just to uh, say a few words about that. So the, the concept behind the Lucy mission is that the mission is going to explore what we call planetary fossils. So these are early remnant of the formation of the solar system. These are asteroids. And um, so the, the logo, as you see, uh, there's a spacecraft rendering of the Lucy mission at the center. Uh, on the, on the right-hand side, there are the two asteroids. Uh, but intriguingly enough, on the left-hand side, we find this um, a schematic rendering of a skeleton. What is that and why that is in the logo of a NASA mission? Well, it turns out that the name of the mission itself, Lucy, is after uh, the human ancestor fossil that was found in 1974 in Ethiopia that was named uh, Lucy. Now, there's another interesting twist to this story. Uh, you will notice also that the shape of the log of the mission is overall that of a diamond. And that is, in fact, because the Armenian Lucy was named um, thanks to the Beatles song that was famous back in 74, and it is still today, Lucy in the Sky with Diamond. And so while the team that discovered the fossils at night were, were playing that music in their camp, and so that's why the uh, name Lucy was uh, given um, to, the, um, to the fossils. And so here we are playing with these several ideas, right? So the NASA Lucy mission will study the fossils of planets 
formations. And we hope that as lucid the fossil was important to understanding um, the evolution of our species on the planet, uh, we hope that the lucid mission will really help us understanding the formation of the solar system. Uh, with that said, I would like to give you a, a quick um, introduction of where Lucy is going. It is going to uh, explore the so-called Trojan asteroids. The Trojan asteroids are found in this animation. You see those two clouds of objects uh, that are leading and trailing Jupiter along its orbit. Uh, these are the Trojan asteroids. We think that um, there may be uh, of the order of one million asteroids larger than one kilometer in this, uh, in this populations of objects, and we have never seen them before at close range. The largest of them is Hector, and it's about 225 kilometer in diameter. So here is a sort of overview of what the Lucy mission would do. We have one spacecraft that will visit eight asteroids over a time span of 12 years. What you see here is, again, a different rendering of the solar system from top down. There are the orbits of the planet, the Earth and Mars, and the uh, Trojan asteroids that are divided into uh, major clouds. These are uh, sometimes called the L4 and L5 uh, clouds, uh, leading and trailing, respectively, um, Jupiter along its orbit. But in between them, there is the main belt of asteroids and another large um, collection of asteroids. And so what the Lucy um, mission will do is travel through the asteroid belt and reach the Trojan asteroids. In passing uh, the main belt, uh, we'll have an opportunity to fly by a main belt asteroid in 2025. Uh, it will give us an opportunity to rehearse and test our procedures. Eventually, uh, we will um, have five um, encounters with Trojan asteroids from 2027 to 2033, and this will give us a total of seven uh, Trojan asteroids. And in fact, uh, there are uh, there are many records associated with the Lucy mission. Uh, one of them is this will be the uh, most asteroids ever visited by any uh, single mission. Now, I would like to uh, give a little bit of um, uh, background of what is the science uh, driving uh, the Lucy mission. Um, and I have two main ideas or concepts that I would like to discuss. The first one is really to boldly go where no one else has gone before. Uh, this means that we are going to explore asteroids that we have never seen uh, previously up close. And so, in a way, it's really exploring uncharted territories. You know, that reminds me of the ancient explorers that will go uh, exploring places where no one has been before. And so, this is kind of the excitement that we have also with the Lucy mission. The second point that I would like to make is that, as we have anticipated early, the Trojans hold vital clues of the giant planet formation. We said these are regarded as the fossils of planet formation. Well, let me explain you why. What the diagram show here is um, it's a schematic way of how the solar system could have formed. We have um, the four major uh, planets that we see here, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And as the planets were forming, they were embedded in a sea of smaller objects that we call planetesimals. These were the seeds of the larger planets, um, but, but this large reservoir of planetesimals were uh, pushed around, uh, scattered, as we say, thanks to the formation of the giant planets. Some of them, a tiny fraction perhaps, uh, but some of them ended up captured as Trojan asteroids where we find them today. So these processes are extremely important in shaping the early solar system, and therefore uh, the Trojan asteroids give an opportunity to study that processes. There's another interesting aspect here that um, uh, the Trojan asteroids appears to be a collection of different um, uh, types of asteroids, uh, having different colors, perhaps, and that may be um, a an indication that the fact that these objects formed over a wide range of distances from the sun, 
possibly then indicating very different compositions. And so all of this is really the, the main motivation uh, scientifically for, for the Lucy mission to explore the Trojan asteroids. But I also would like to give a little bit of a sense of really um, the science behind all this. So uh, just a little bit more details about that, which I think are fascinating. Um, what you see here is um, a, a, a pictures from an actual numerical simulation to study the formation of the planet. And we go from panel A, B, C, and D uh, in progressive uh, with time. Um, and so this is a very simplified view, uh, but this is how we understand the formation of the planet uh, to date. What you see from panel A, you have the sun at the center, and then you have four different circles. So these are representing the orbits of the giant planet, as we have seen in the previous chart. So your uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Um, outside of the planets, we have this large reservoir um, of, of smaller planetesimals, as we saw, we can call these primordial comets or planetesimals. Uh, now, the interesting aspect is that when the solar system formed, um, the planets were in a very compact configuration. You'll notice that those circles there are close to each other, relatively speaking. As the time went by, a time scale of tens of billions of years, uh, perhaps, the planets started uh, uh, perturbating each other and, and um, moving. And you'll notice in panel B that the orbits are now a little bit larger. This, as a, as a consequence of these movements of the planets, is that the outer disk of planetesimal, it's going to be uh, destabilized by dynamical perturbation because the planets are getting closer and closer to that. And this brings the planets uh, to an unstable configuration, what we call an instability, in which the uh, mutual um, dynamical perturbations are very strong. And so the planets are scattered into very different orbits. And we see that in panel C. You'll notice that now the circles indicating the orbits of the planets are very, very different than when they started from. But because of this, and a further expansion of Uranus and Neptune in particular, the outer disk is completely destabilized. All those objects flying around in the solar system. And here is where some of them ended up being trapped as Jupiter Trojans. Eventually, after 200 million years or so, the system settled down. Um, most of these objects, uh, the planetesimal, are removed from the solar system. Some of them becomes the Cooper Belt object. And the planets finally acquire their current configuration, which is shown in panel D. And as you'll see, this is a very different orbit arrangement than they started from. Now, we think that this is the process, fundamental process, that shaped the solar system. And something like this probably happened within the first, um, the, the, the instability, so from B to C, probably happened within the first 100 million years or so formation. And therefore, the Trojans that were captured by this process give us an opportunity really to understand uh, how this um, instability took place. Uh, we also talk about the uh, physical properties of the Trojans. I already mentioned that they come in a variety of colors. Uh, so let me elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, so what do we know about the Trojans? We said already that we have not visited the, the Trojans uh, before uh, with the spacecraft, which is true. However, we have uh, been observing the Trojans thanks to ground-based telescopes or space telescopes such as the Hubble Space Telescope. And so we have um, some understanding, although rough, but still we have some understanding of these objects, which is summarized over here. Well, the, first of all, they are very dark. Some of them are even darker than charcoal, as a reference. They exhibit a wide range of colors, uh, from gray to very red. This is shown in the plot to the left. These are spectra of, of um, average um, asteroids, and um, uh, the visible wavelengths will be between 0.5 and 0.9 uh, microns. So that's what we can actually see with our own eyes. And here is the... Um, 
the near infrared. And we have three major spectral types within the Trojans. One is called a C type, uh, which is basically a flat uh, spectrum. Uh, and that, therefore, is something that uh, it will look gray uh, to our own eyes. And then we have something that is a little bit of a slope. Uh, so it would be a, a red object, and this is called the P types. And finally, we have also what we call the D-type, that is an extremely sloped uh, spectrum uh, that is therefore very, very red. Now, we think that this variation in surface color may reflect uh, variation in composition, but we don't really know. Uh, that's why we need the, the a space mission. We already said that, that the Trojans comes in a variety of sizes. Some are tiny, uh, uh, you know, kilometers or all the way smaller, up to 225 kilometers, which is the largest of them. And also, interestingly, we have estimate of the density of some of the Trojan asteroids thanks to the fact that the, some of them have satellites, and this can be used to derive the density. Densities range from 0.8 grams per centimeter cube. Uh, that is less than water to about uh, two grams per centimeter cube. As a reference, that would be the density of a light rock, such as limestone. So that is the range of density. But because all of this, it's, um, it's obvious that the Trojan asteroids are not uniform in, in any way. They are extremely um, complex mixture of different uh, properties. And therefore, in order to study uh, the Trojan asteroids successfully, we need to uh, look at many of them. In other words, it wouldn't be enough to have a mission going through flyby one Trojan asteroid. Uh, certainly, we will understand everything about that one asteroid, but we will miss an opportunity to understand the variety. And that is where Lucy comes into play. Here is a family portrait of the Lucy target. And so the first thing that jumps out um, is that there are many targets because in order to probe the, via, the diversity within the Trojan asteroid, we really need to observe many targets. And so that's one of the exciting uh, facts about the Lucy mission. Now, I also want to say um, that um, this is what you see on this chart is an artistic conceptions of our targets. We certainly do not know the properties of their surfaces as you see here, right? So this is just you, uh, an artistic um, uh, rendering. Um, but what we do know though, is the relative sizes of the object. The sizes can be inferred by the magnitude, the visual magnitudes, uh, the brightness, if you will, of these objects. And so that allows us to, to derive the relative sizes. And, um, and also what we know is the color of the surface. So you'll notice, for instance, that the Eurybates, it's a gray object. And then we have red objects. And finally, we have very red objects. So again, to probe the full uh, variability. Another interesting aspect is that Lucy will visit both uh, clouds of Trojans, the L4 and the L5, as indicated over here. And now, <clears throat> I would like also to give you a little bit of a sense of what we actually observe from, from uh, ground-based telescopes or the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which is shown in these two pictures, right? So these are a picture of Uribate and uh, a picture of Patroclus and Menonitius. These are a binary system, so they orbit around each other. Um, I will comment on that later. But these are really the best pictures that we have so far. So just to give you a sense of, um, of the limited information that we have about, this, about these objects. Now, I'd like to give you a little bit more details about uh, two of our targets uh, that I think they are particularly uh, intriguing. And the first one is Uribate. Uh, what do we know about Uribate? Well, first of all, we, we know that it's a gray type. Um, and it is very uncommon among the Trojan asteroids. There are very few objects with this, these properties. And so um, that could be interesting. Maybe it's a peculiar composition there. Uh, the other intriguing aspect is that uh, Uribate is uh, a member of what we call an asteroid family, meaning it is the uh, fragment of a much larger object that was completely destroyed in the past, billions of years ago, by a catastrophic 
disruption, such as indicated in this picture here, right? So, of course, this is again an artistic uh, rendering, but you can imagine that Uribates is uh, one of these fragments or, 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 or a bunch of fragments together. And, and, and also the, this event uh, generated many other smaller fragments that are uh, belong to the asteroid family. Now, this is, um, uh, it's a process of catastrophic disruption of asteroid, which is paramount in order to understand the evolution of, of asteroids. So collisions are extremely important. And this will be the first time we have an opportunity to study an object uh, that was formed by a catastrophic disruption. Here is an animation that shows that process. This is an actual calculation that tries to simulate a disruption of a large object. And as you'll see, there are fragments that are generated, large clumps. Uh, this could be irribates, for instance. And there are lots of debris flying around. Right, so that debris, some of that coalesces to form larger fragments, um, uh, but some of them, uh, those frags may remain bound uh, in orbit, so to speak, around uh, around Uribates, as we see in this uh, animation, and that could be the origin of the uh, satellite uh, that uh, Uribate has. And you already, I didn't comment on that because I want to give you a full explanation. But as it happens, Uribates as a small satellite, um, which it's called uh, Keta. Now, why Keta? Uh, this is actually a discovery done by the Lucy Science teams just uh, over the last um, couple of years. So it's a very new uh, addition uh, to the target list. And uh, it was named Keta in honor to Eriqueta Basilio, which was the first female to light the uh, Olympic cauldron in Mexico City in, in 68. And so uh, a team uh, for naming the Trojan asteroids, beside, of course, the uh, from ancient Greek names uh, from the Troy War, it's also names of athletes. And so uh, uh, the small satellites was named after, um, after Keta. Um, so, and we think that perhaps the formation of Keta could be the results of this catastrophic collision. So this is a very exciting target for, for the Lucy mission. Uh, a little bit more details about Uribates. Now, uh, here what you see is not, this is this shape that you see here. Now, it's not an artistic rendering anymore. This is really the best shape model reconstruction. It's a 3D model that we have for Uribates, thanks to a tremendous amount of telescopic data collected from the ground. So putting all the pictures together, this is a 3D uh, shape model reconstruction, which is coarse, of course, we don't really know the details, but that's the best we can do. The average size is about 64 kilometers in diameter. Uh, the picture to the right shows the actual image for which Keta was discovered. You see this bright glow would be Uribates, and, and here this little uh, speck of light on the site is actually the discovery of the satellites. We estimate that the satellite is about one kilometer or so in size. We were also able to derive the orbits of the satellites, semi-major axis, eccentricity, and period, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and that uh, brought that to an interesting question. The Lucy mission is going to fly by Uribates, but the question is, originally we didn't know that there was a satellite, and so would that be a concern for the mission? Uh, could there be a risk of colliding with the satellite, perhaps? And so we carried on a detailed investigation, and, and the results are shown in these two panels. Now, the, the white dot is at the center uh, of the XYZ coordinates, it's Uribates, of both panels. We also indicate by the arrow uh, the trajectory of the spacecraft. You will notice that at the closest approach, Lucy will be within a thousand kilometer from, from Uribates, that the minimum distance. And in red, we have indicated the possible positions of Keta. You know, the orbit is not known precisely to know where the objects will be. So we have sort of a, a probability distribution. But as you see, the spacecraft, it's not going to go through the, um, the, the possible positions for the satellites, particularly you will see here, it's just flying below it. And so bringing, meaning there is no concern 
for the spacecraft. And of course, the spacecraft will try to observe the small satellite as much as possible during the flyby. With that said, I want to talk about the last targets. These are Patroclus and Menetius. It's an extremely interesting object. Uh, what you see here is, again, an artistic uh, rendering of the two objects orbiting each other. Because they have similar masses and similar sizes, um, they orbit around each other in a strange way, perhaps some familiar way, because the center of mass of the system is, is, is in a place you know, in the line that connects the two objects. So that's why they are rotating both of them uh, in the way that you see in the animation. We have never seen an object like that before at close range. If you think about it, all the satellites that we are aware of are around a much larger object. It's a good example is the Earth and the Moon. So we have a big Earth and a small Moon going around. Now, Eurybates and, and Keta will be a similar thing. And here, we are looking at something entirely different. So two large objects that goes around each other. We think that the formation of particles and Menonesius is really key to understand um, uh, the formation of the planet azimuths in the early solar system. And so we are very eager uh, to study uh, this uh, binary system. Uh, with that said, <clears throat> we discussed that um, we have many targets uh, to go after. Uh, what well, that clearly imply uh, a peculiar trajectory that would allow the spacecraft to go through all, so many targets. And the trajectory of the Lucy spacecraft is really, it's really at the heart of the mission. What is enabling the mission to do the science that we have planned for? And I would like to show a little bit of that. I have here two animations coming up. Uh, the one, uh, they show the same thing basically, but the one to the left will give you the um, the position of Lucy as it moves uh, from Earth to the asteroids uh, in an inertial reference frame. So all the planets are moving around. You'll see Jupiter is in the, um, the green uh, circle. And the white dots are the asteroids targets of the Lucy mission. And the same thing is going to be shown to the right. But now the, um, it's a different reference frame. And Jupiter will remain fixed in this position at the top. Right, so Lucy launched uh, just um, a month ago uh, on top of an Atlas V uh, rocket, and um, and that was the beginning of a four billion uh, miles uh, journey, and and uh, you will see that over here. So Lucy goes around into the inner solar system a couple of times. Uh, we have um, Earth flybys. Uh, those are needed in order to adjust the trajectory of the spacecraft. After that, Lucy will go out. Remember, the first thing we're going to do is cross the main belt, and that gives us an opportunity to study a main belt asteroid, which is called Donald Johansson. And that is not a random name you may recognize. In fact, Donald Johansson was one of the discoverers of the Lucy uh, hominin fossils. And... Um, this was a previously unnamed uh, small asteroid, about five kilometers in diameter or so, that the Lucy team uh, named after uh, Donald Johans. This will give us an opportunity to test uh, our procedures, to test our instrumentation. Donna Johansson, the asteroid, is not one of the primary targets for the Lucy mission. It's not a Trojan asteroid. But it is still a very interesting object in itself. After that, we'll add out to the uh, L4 crowd of Trojan asteroids. And we'll have uh, four encounters, one after the other, over a time span of 15 months. So this will be extremely uh, busy. We do Eurybates, uh, Polymele, uh, Lucas, and Oros. And so these are the targets that we already looked at previously that we will be able to observe uh, during this time frame. After Oros, the spacecraft, this is already 2028, uh, the spacecraft will come back down into the inner solar system for a final uh, flyby with the Earth. That flyby would allow to slightly adjust the orbit of the spacecraft and send it 
towards the L5 cloud of the Trojan asteroids uh, for the final encounter of Patroclus and Menonitius, which will happen in 2033. And that would be at the end of the primary mission. Um, it's interesting now to look at these diagrams with the orbit because it really uh, gives you the sense that if we were to continue this animation, the Lucy spacecraft will keep doing the same thing. That is, come in uh, to 1 AU, come close to the Earth, and then jump out to 5 AU, and then come back and forth, and so on. In fact, this is a relatively stable orbit. We think the, the, the mission may be locked on that position for, uh, for a long time, perhaps up to uh, millions of years. And that gives us uh, an opportunity to uh, put some uh, messages onto uh, the Lucy spacecraft that perhaps our descendants may find in the future. And so we built a plaque uh, with messages written from uh, prominent uh, thinkers of our society. Um, and also there is a diagram showing the position of the planets at the time that Lucy launched. Um, and this plaque will remain uh, on the spacecraft for perhaps millions of years. And so here uh, we can speculate that um, in the far future, our descendants may roam far and wide across the solar system and perhaps may end up finding uh, the Lucy spacecraft. And, and then they could have um, received these messages that were written there from them. So this is a nice addition um, that we have done uh, for uh, for the Lucy mission. But now, finally, after uh, going through many different ideas about the Trojan asteroids, let me present you with the spacecraft. What you see here is a, a, it's a rendering of the of the spacecraft, and I want to just give you a couple of highlights um, just to tell you how complex it is. There have been more than 500 people working uh, to assemble and design and test uh, the spacecraft in itself. Total mass is about um, 1,500 kilograms. That's as much as a rhino, for reference. And half of that mass is full, which is contained in a tank within the main body of the spacecraft. There are more than three kilometers of wires that allows all the circuits to be connected throughout the spacecraft and the solar panels. Another intriguing aspect about the construction of Lucy is that it goes from one AU, right, close to the sun, all the way to five, back and forth. And so this comes with um, very strong thermal excursions. And so the the design of the spacecraft need to be able to withstand a temperature swing that goes from minus 150 to plus 150 Celsius. So these are some of the highlights of the of the mission. Uh, for reference, how big it is? It's about 16 meters from one side to the other, um, and that, for reference, is about a four-story uh, building. And um, let me tell you a little bit about the payload, uh, that is to say the instrumentations uh, that uh, the Lucy spacecraft carries. All the main instruments are located at what we call payload platform, is this little uh, structure that sticks out at the top of the spacecraft. And the instruments that we carry are the following. We have a lorry, which is basically a small um, telescope to acquire high resolution uh, black and white images. Uh, we have Hell Ralph, which is double instrument. It contains uh, a, 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 a color uh, telescope imager, if you will, so it will allow to take color picture. And then there is an infrared spectrometer uh, to quite uh, for spectroscopy of our targets. Then we have a test, which is a thermal emission spectrometer operating in the infrared that allows us to estimate uh, properties of the surface, such as, for instance, the temperature. Then we have two additional small cameras, T2 cam, and these are used um, uh, for the spacecraft in order to be able to lock onto the onto the asteroids as we fly by and keep them in the position so that all the instruments can observe them. 
it's a very important aspect of the mission. And also those pictures will be used for, uh, for science. And finally, we have what we call the high gain antenna, this iconic uh, fissure at the center. Now, this is not an instrument, uh, properly speaking. In fact, the antenna, of course, it is used to communicate back and forth uh, uh, from, from Earth with a spacecraft. However, uh, the antenna allows us to um, monitor precisely the position of the spacecraft in space. And because we will be flying by these asteroids, the asteroids would um, uh, deflect a little bit the trajectory of the spacecraft. And so by measuring that deflection, we are able to derive the masses of our targets. All of these um, comprehensive set of uh, instruments will provide will allow the science team to carry on a number of investigations ranging from the geology of the surface, their colors and compositions, uh, con uh, try to constrain the internal properties um, because we will measure mass, as we said, we'll also measure volumes. And so therefore we have a sense of the density. And finally, we will look for satellites and rings. Here is the uh, payload uh, platform um, in the lab as it was assembled. And I like this picture because it really gives you a sense of the complexity that goes on um, to assemble all the instruments together in a very confined space. And, and the human uh, there gives you a reference of the scale of this, which is, which is la rather large. And here is a rendering that shows the position of the all uh, or the instruments on board onto the uh, platform. Now we said that um, the orbit of the Lucy mission is peculiar because it is very eccentric, meaning goes from one AU close to the Earth all the way to five AU, and so this allows uh, the spacecraft to um, to be at varying distances from the sun. Now, why that is important? Now, the spacecraft here is solar powered. So all the energy that is needed to run the spacecraft is derived from the sun. So uh, with solar cells. And so uh, the fact that the spacecraft uh, uh, ranges from one AU to five AU implies that there is a great variability of, of solar incidents and therefore we need to have a very large solar panels when we are a five astronomical units in order to be able to have enough power and really the solar panels are one of the key aspects of the mission um, they are 7.2 meters in diameters and we have um, two of them and in fact Lucy will be the farthest uh, operated solar power spacecraft from the sun um, and I also want to show you a little animation how the unfolding of the spacecraft was done on Earth. Uh, this, the solar panels are folded uh, when the spacecraft is launched, and when they are in space, they need to open. And so it's a rather complex uh, procedure. What I find striking about this is that the solar panel itself is very light. All those cells that you see here are attached to a cloth, and so it's not really a super rigid structure. Uh, that is what it's enabling the spacecraft to do, um, to do uh, you know, all the science that we have planned for. Finally, let me show you how, uh, how does it work, right? Because we said that um, the Lucy mission will execute a number of flybys, but how does that look like? What does it mean? Well, basically the spacecraft will fly by close some of the asteroids and in doing so it will carry on a number of observations and then the spacecraft is gone onto the next onto the next flyby so with this rendering here give you a sense of what's going on during a, a single flyby um, what i have here just to introduce i have two uh, asteroids i mean initius and Patroclus. they are over here so this is a a simulation of how that uh, specific flyby will look like. Uh, you see a rendering on the spacecraft. There are various arrows pointing in different direction. Um, there are a bunch of technical aspects of the distance, for instance. You don't really need to worry about this. Uh, what's interesting here is the list of instruments. And every time one instrument is operating, 
the, they will change color. So from gray, they will change color. And this will give you a sense of how really a flyby works. So the spacecraft here is approaching uh, the targets now. You will see they're slightly moving, coming closer. Uh, the spacecraft, of course, is adjusting attitude and orientation. And you'll notice those flash in every now and then. Uh, yes, now uh, Ralph, Lisa is taking pictures and, and all the others one after. Now, of course, this is run in 200 times faster than in real time. Um, because we don't want to stay here for many hours. Uh, but this gives you a sense of how a flyby works. Extremely complex activity. In a matter of a few hours, the spacecraft has to be able to accommodate a tremendous amount of, of operation, including taking data, adjusting the attitude, uh, and all of that. So it's extremely... Uh, everything needs to be planned well ahead of time. There is no real-time iteration here. Everything is already planned before this take place, months before this take place. That's how a flyby uh, works. You will see both objects. Now, this is the closest approach. It's about 1,000 kilometers. And then the spacecraft goes off, uh, and it keeps rotating, and it keeps observing uh, the asteroids for, for some time until the asteroids are too far. And at that point, the flyby is uh, concluded. When the flyby is concluded is when the um, transmission of the data that has been gathered can happen. And so here is where the transmission to Earth starts, which may take weeks or months, depending. All right, now um, uh, we are approaching the end of the, the talk. And I would like just to show you some pretty picture at this point. Um, I really like this one picture. Um, this was taken uh, end of September this year. Uh, this is really the time in which the spacecraft, which is here at the center, was um, encapsulated within what we call the fairing of the rocket. That is to say the, the top of the rocket, the tip of the rocket, if you will. And I like this picture because this is the time in which the spacecraft was concealed uh, from our view, right? And the next time that the spacecraft is outside, the fairing will be in space. So if you will, this is the, the last time we could see the spacecraft up close. You'll notice there is the, um, the instruments are located in the platform over here. Another interesting aspect is the high gain antenna over here. And also this uh, dark triangular shape. Well, those are the sonar panels, one of them, which is completely folded. And there is one on the other side. Here is the lifting, um, very frightening moment. Uh, here is the lifting of the spacecraft and the tip of the rocket uh, onto the rocket. So uh, that's how it's done. Another interesting picture is uh, from top down. Now, the rocket is fully assembled, as you see, with the, uh, with the fairing over here, and Lucy sits inside. But this is done in the assemble, assembly facility for, for the rocket. This is not where the rocket launches into space. We have to move the rocket all assembled from here to the launch pad. So this is what we call rolled out, and this is the starting of it. So basically, the rocket is dragged onto a railway line onto the launch pod. And that is the day before launch, October 15, uh, 2021. Now, the uh, Lucy, the rocket and all, it's uh, ready to go, and it is located on the launch pod. You will see here uh, the science team. Uh, that we were gathering just the day uh, before before lunch. And finally, uh, countdown and blast off. This took place on the 16th at 5.35 a.m. It was a wonderful um, morning um, for, for, for a spectacular lunch. Here we see just a couple of seconds after ignition. Um, we have uh, just a view from the side. Uh, an interesting aspect here is that the exhaust of the rocket is pushed. There is an underground tunnel in cement that pushes the exhaust on one side. So we can take these nice and clear pictures, among other reasons. 
here is another uh, picture from one other side. And, um, and there's one more picture that I really like, that is this one. Uh, this is really a high resolution picture of the exhaust coming out uh, from the main uh, stage of the rocket. And it's really an amazing sp uh, spectacle of fire and smoke uh, that we, uh, we saw that morning. Uh, this is um, Lucy going up. Um, an interesting aspect of that day was that um, just over uh, the launch pad, there was uh, a few clouds, scattered clouds. And so that really uh, made the launch a very um, dramatic experience because of all the, um, the, the play with lights and shadows, um, as you see over here. This is the long exposure picture. You see the trajectory of the spacecraft going up uh, straight. And this is what I was mentioning earlier, this cloud deck that uh, really made the experience amazing because of all the interplates of louts and shadows. Um, so it was really fortunate uh, conditions to have this uh, um, cloud um, over here. Um, and here's another picture you'll see uh, the, the clouds are over here. The Lucy Scrafer goes through, come on the other side. Uh, and then eventually, because we are launching from the uh, Florida coast, all the rockets bend east uh, going over the Atlantic. And so that's, that's what you see over here. And there is also a reflection into the lagoon uh, there. So that's very dramatic uh, pictures. And... Uh, Finally, I want to give you a more recent update. Um, that is, in fact, uh, we can now say that Lucy is in the sky with not with diamonds, but with stars. And these are the first pictures taken by the instruments aboard the Lucy uh, on November 7th. Uh, so very recent. And we have the first picture of the T2 cam. Uh, what you see here is a star field. There's lots of stars. And also there is a lorry uh, picture and you'll notice other little star. There is no scientific values here, of course. Um, these are just test uh, images that have been taken just to verify that the instruments are working properly. And, and they are. So everything, uh, um, it's, um, it's working properly. And finally, I would like to um, just remind you that we have uh, social media channels if you are interested in following the Lucy mission as well as website. And I will be happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Simone. Uh, I was uh, uh, waiting for Antigona, but I think she is experiencing some internet internet problems. Okay, she is back. Just a second. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for for this very interesting talk. When you said this is a pretty picture, I didn't know <laughs> because <laughs> what you were talking about because there were pretty pictures everywhere in your in your talk oh, thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much and i want to thank uh patricia hernandez resendiz who helped us with the technical stuff here because as as as, as, as i said before uh this is the first time we use it so uh thank you very much patricia for for your help uh your technical help because it was really really a great help always we wouldn't be the, doing this in in such a smooth way um so we are going go we are going to go to the questions i don't know uh miguel go ahead <laughs> oh miguel is frozen now <laughs> well i do have a question <laughs> about yes. the compositions of the of the asteroids because um we have well we as a scientific community we have some idea of what these uh, asteroids are made of right uh but how much we are going to to gain with uh with the information because i mean the 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 it's not like the the spacecraft is going to go very close to it we are going to relay on images and um anyway it's more closer than we can <laughs> it, it's closer than we can do it from Earth, but how much we can we can learn about the the compositions of these uh, uh, asteroids with with the with the spacecraft? Yes, um, 
that's a that's a good question um it is correct that we have ideas on the composition of the asteroids uh, but we want to make a little bit of distinctions there uh, because uh, what we know about asteroids uh, for the most part it um, refers to the main belt asteroids right so these are the asteroids that are closer to us and why do we know them better uh, the reason is because we actually have samples from them in the form of meteorites. So the fact that we have meteorites that come from main belt asteroids really allow us to, to study the details of their makeup and composition. And on top of that, then we do telescopic observation uh, of the asteroids, you know, spectroscopy, imaging, in order to get additional uh, information. There has been other spacecraft, such as the Dawn mission, that has been around other main belt asteroids. So all of that together give us um, some uh, detailed information about the main belt asteroids. But the Trojan asteroids are very different for two main reasons. But the first of all, we do not think we have any meteorites coming from the Trojan asteroids. So that means we do not have any piece of rock from them. And so we lack that important uh, piece of information. Um, and the other aspect is that the Trojan asteroid, uh, at least based on current models, current understanding, they formed potentially in a very different way than other main belt asteroids. So main belt asteroids could have formed closer to the sun, perhaps closer to the terrestrial planets while the Trojan asteroids may have formed much farther out, really in the outer solar system, and then been trapped. And because of that, therefore, what we know about main belt asteroid may not really apply to the Trojan asteroids. So we don't really know much about them after all. So what it is that the Lucy mission can do? Clearly, we are not landing on the surface. We are not picking up material. That would not be possible. Uh, but we fly by. And so in a flyby, we do things such as taking picture. Uh, but in terms of composition, we do have a spectrometer. So we take spectra of the surfaces. And because we have a very high resolution, we can actually tell apart one region to the other one and use the spectra to inform about what is the overall composition, but also if there is a change of composition across the surface. So this kind of detailed information can be derived with the instrumentation uh, that we have, even though we will not touch the surface and so we will not be able to analyze you know, the materials. Thank you very much. Miguel, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Antigona, and thank you very much, Simone, for for the great talk you have just uh, given us, and uh, lots of interesting things in this, uh, as I usually say, fantastic. All, all space missions are fantastic, but this is particularly fantastic because it's going is it is going very very far away. So. Uh, uh, we have several questions from the, our audience in Facebook and and. And, and YouTube. So let me go with the first one. Uh, uh, and before that, uh, I, I will say this in Spanish. If, si hay alguien de la audiencia que quiere hacer una pregunta y no sabe cómo escribirla en inglés, escríbela en español y yo hago la traducción sim, uh, in, inmediatamente. Okay? So the first question is from Luisa Ramirez, who asks, uh, uh, which kind of minerals or elements do you expect to find on the surface of, of Eurobates. This mission is awesome. Thanks for the talk. Thanks for the question. I think the it's always interesting to speculate what we might find, right? We do that all the time, trying to figure out or anticipate uh, what we might find. But reality is, is that um, it's hard. It's hard to predict for the reason that I just explained, because the Trojan asteroid formed in the outer solar system, uh, so it's a very different environment than the more common main belt asteroids. Perhaps we don't have samples in the form of meteorites. So it's sort of, uh, I would like to make the analogy that I made earlier in the talk. It's like uh, the, the past explorers, right, where they were going to uncharted territory. They didn't really know what to expect. And that's kind of that uh, feeling that we have over here. But have, anyhow, I can make some guesses. 
Um, there's one interesting aspect about the Trojans, which I said, it is their color. Some of them are very red. Now, the fact that they're very red is intriguing. That is not something that we commonly find within the main belt asteroids. So that could indicate a very different composition. So what are the reasons why a surface could be red? Um, there are many possible explanations, but one that comes to mind is the presence of organic matter. So if you have carbon or compounds that contain carbons or organic matter, that could give you some uh, red coloration. And so perhaps we are dealing with objects that have lots of carbon. Um, ISIS could also be there because they formed in the outer solar system. And so and therefore a much cold environment. And so these are sort of kind of the things that we we expect to find, but we don't really know. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Irma Lozada uh, says, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Markey, for such an amazing talk. Two questions. The first is, which are the backup systems, tools for possible technical problems in the function and maintenance of Lucy at space? Yes, um, that is also an interesting question. And in fact, um, it's always important to remind ourselves that this is an extremely complex uh, robot. Right? It's a spacecraft. Uh, it's a robot, extremely complex, and yet it's um, millions of miles away. So if something happened, we cannot really go and fix it. So what are the um the things that we can do in order to uh, prevent uh that uh, most of many of the circuits and electronic components are redundant so meaning that if something were to fail there may be another component or another parts that can be used in order to keep operating as planned so there is a lot of redundancy as we say in the system itself um so that is how a spacecraft is is built so that if a problem comes up there are there are workarounds in order to try to fix it. either use another component or or uh or use software sometimes it's an issue with the software and the software can be sent and updated to the spacecraft and that's something that's done regularly it's like your own uh computer right so every every now and then you have to update your operating system well the same is true for the spacecraft there is lots of new software that if needed can be uploaded in order to fix problems mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. And the second question is, how is the Lucy team going to storage and share the information uh, across the scientific community that is sent back to Earth by Lucy? Yes, all the NASA missions have an underlying uh, agreement that the data needs to be released to the public after a few months after being, being gathered. Uh, and that applies also to the Lucy mission. So the data will be transmitted back to Earth. Of course, there is going to be a phase of several months in which the data needs to be checked and, and, and if there are issues, they need to be resolved. Once that is done, the data is uh, uh, put onto a NASA public archive. And so anybody can connect to that archive, download the data and use the data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Lorenzo Olguin asks, were the targets chosen on scientific basis or based on the optimal positions? In parentheses, path. Yes, uh, that's also another interesting question. I did stress the fact that the, um, the need for this mission was to observe as many targets as possible because the Trojans are very diverse and observing just one or two would really not make much of a difference. We really try to observe as many as possible. So that tells us that we need to have a trajectory that allow us to, to observe many targets. Now, that is not a trivial thing to achieve because these objects are very far in space one to each other. So there is an element of luck in being able to find the trajectory that allows you to observe many targets. But also, on top of the element luck, if you will, there is also a team of uh, people that really 
a plan the trajectory of the spacecraft in very very detail and so uh, that takes months and months of testing uh, you have say one trajectory and then you want to tweak it because there is an interesting target you want to you want to try to fly by and so then the the team try to adjust the trajectory to accommodate that so there is lots of iteration what you see today is of the the final trajectory is really the results of many 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 months of iterations trying to go after many targets that would allow us to probe uh, the diversity mm -hmm. thank you very much and uh, i don't see more questions here so i will take advantage to make mine which is more a curiosity <laughs> yeah, Patty has one. one too but i have one Ah, go ahead. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Patty. Hi, Simone. Um, Hi, um, I have a question. There is that uh, there are many um, objectives that you mentioned and you um, plan to, to visit, but there are many, uh, some possibility that uh, the mission, once it get to the to the last one, um, plan to, to go to the other, to other um, um, target? Yes, uh, the, there is such possibilities. The way the, the, the NASA missions uh, work is that, of course, you have to make, um, propose, you know, a, a trajectory and, and a certain number of targets of objects that you want to study. So that's what we call the primary mission. And that's what I have described today. Okay. If all goes well, at the end of the primary mission, uh, it is possible, perhaps, that we will get uh, an extension that is, uh, we can have, uh, NASA can give us more time to, uh, to do other things. Now, that's not, it's not planned for now. It's something that we'll have to decide in the future, but, but there is that possibility. And so, because the spacecraft is on this interesting orbit, you can imagine that the spacecraft after the last target, Plato, Close and Venetius, would come close to the Earth again. And in doing so, we'll, we'll cross uh, the main belt uh, one more time. And so maybe there are other main belt asteroids that we can, we can look. So this is a real possibility. It all uh, uh, depends whether or not the spacecraft at the end of the mission, uh, whether or not everything is functioning properly. I mean, if the spacecraft is in good shape and everything is working fine, I think there is good chance that we'll be able to do other other targets. Perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, then Miguel, you, you yeah. have your question. Well, I would jump uh, to another question, which actually you just answered, because Lorenzo Olguin asked, uh, oh, yeah. uh, do you have any plans of what to do with the spacecraft after the last target? So you just mentioned it. That yeah, not there are yet. No plans, but there are chances. Yes, exactly. <laughs> to do something with the main aster asteroid belt, yes. asteroids. Uh -huh. And uh, and from my side, it's, it's, it's kind of a curiosity because uh, when when doing a flyby, if I were part of a space mission, I would be nervous if, if, if you are too close to to a target. You mentioned that the, close, the closest you will reach, it, it will be something like a thousand kilometers, right? So the thousand kilometer is true for uh, all of the targets except one. Uh, there is one target, uh, which is the smallest of all of them, which is Polymeli, uh, that uh, we will fly by uh, with a distance of about 400 kilometers. And the reason why that flyby is much closer is because uh, we wanna, as we discussed, right, we wanna get derive the mass uh, of all the objects by, by the perturbation of the spacecraft. And because that uh, polymeri object is much smaller than the other ones, in order to get the, per the mass, we need to fly much closer. So that justifies the 400 kilometers. All the others will be around 1,000 kilometers. And, uh, and related to that question is, uh, I mean, uh, thinking that uh, the spacecraft will travel 25 astronomical units. Uh, uh, what are the uncertainties in the calculation of the trajectory that, uh, that uh, Lucy will, will fly? 
Yes, um, the trajectory, it's uh, typically well known with precision. So what you saw in the diagram there and the flybys and the distances from the objects and also the dates where the flyby will take place are already known with, um, with precision with, with the only uh, caveat that um, the spacecraft now it's on its orbit but the evolution in the future of the trajectory is not just purely gravity. So in other words, it's not just the spacecraft, it's not just let, let on its own uh, path, uh, gravity, you know, just using gravity. Uh, the spacecraft needs to correct the trajectory and that's why there are engines on board that would allow to tweak the trajectory. So those, um, uh, tweaks to the orbits require the ignition of the engines on the spacecraft, mm -hmm. right? So those are very important. Until we have done all of them, uh, we don't, you know, there are, there are uncertainties where the spacecraft would be. But, um, uh, but once we do those adjustments, uh, the orbit is going to be known very, very precisely. And the fact that there is an engine that will cool, uh, it allows if something went wrong, say the adjustment is not as you, as you have hoped for, you can then try one more time to adjust. So there is, there is some adjustment in the trajectory. It's not just purely the gravity uh, uh, and all. You know, there, there is also that component. But other than that, the spacecraft trajectory is known precisely. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have uh, several comments and, and more questions. Lucia Gonzalez says, uh, it, it is an amazing project. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Mark Markey. Uh, I'm going to follow close the mission. Thank you. And Lorenzo Olguin has another question. Can you comment on what the community can contribute before the spacecraft arrives to the targets? Yes, in fact, there is already uh, lots of involvement in the, in the community. Uh, for instance, things that can be done are more telescopic observations of our target. For instance, more spectroscopy, try to have a better understanding of their surface composition, um, better understanding of their shapes. Uh, this can be done with telescopic observation from the ground. Uh, if you look up on the uh, Lucy web page at my institute, Southwest Research Institute, there is also a link that tells you uh, how these activities are taking place. And uh, particularly important are the occultations. So there are campaigns in which small telescopes, you don't need a big one, um, can, you can go and try to observe an occultation. That is when the asteroid pass in front of a star. And, and that allow us to actually derive a precise measurement of the size of the asteroid. Many of quotations have already been done over the last three years involving a large number of people spanning from Africa to, uh, to the US and, and Europe. Uh, so please uh, have a look at that information on the website because if there is an eclipse that come close, uh, you may be able to participate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That would be interesting. Yes. We have some telescopes here in Mexico that we can use for that. Actually, yeah. there is one about 40 meters from my office that is being used for characterizing asteroids. Yeah. Uh, in, 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 with photometry, not spectroscopy. But uh, yes. Yeah. But that's what you need for the for the occultations and uh, and uh, really mm -hmm. please uh, take a look at the at the web page because there you can find the list of uh, predicted occultation for the near future uh -huh. and uh, uh, there is a map that shows where the occultation goes you know the shadow and if it happens that you you are close to one of those uh, it, it can be observed so please mm -hmm. take a look at that yeah thank you. We have two more questions, uh, and I think with those we we, we can start closing uh, uh, this uh, uh, your excellent presentation, Lorenzo. Again, ask uh, can you can you comment on the problems on the deployment of one of the solar panels? Yes. Is that already solved? 
it's not yet solved. There is uh, one of the two solar, I remember the animation that I showed in which the solar panels will open and eventually reaches uh, full opening. And when that happened, it basically there is a mechanism that block the position there open. Um, and we have to do this for both solar panels. Uh, one of them has completed the process and it's fully open and it's it's latched as we say so it's an it's uh, it's done uh, the other one uh, did not complete this process it's almost uh, completely open but not a uh, hundred percent and so we are investigating now what is the best uh, course of action um, either leaving as is or or try to close it one more time uh, so this is, it's not um, an urgent issue. Um, uh, and so we are just taking the time to analyze what's going on and, and, and then uh, take um, uh, the course of action uh, to, to fix it. So we are still working on, on that aspect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Karina Elizabeth asks, uh, is there any relationship between, between Troy and asteroids and comets? Excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, there are uh, connections. Um, if you remember, uh, in the first part of the talk, I showed um, the cartoon in which we have the giant planets uh, forming with this um, large reservoir of planetesimals or primordial comets, as I also called them. Uh, some of those objects have been trapped as the Trojan asteroids. But um, other objects has been pushed into the other solar system, uh, perhaps in the Cooper belt or even in the Oort cloud. Now the Cooper belt and the Oort clouds are source of comets. And so in principle, you can think of Trojans and comets as uh, sibling, siblings separated at birth, if you will. Uh, they, they were forming perhaps in the same regions in the solar system, but then they were separated the Trojans ended up capture around Jupiter, um, and uh, and these other objects were pushed in the outer solar system, and and what we see as a comet now are objects that are perturbed and leave those regions, far regions, and come close to Earth. But originally they may have come from from a similar region. This is a possibility. Now we don't really know for sure because. We don't really know precisely how the planets formed, how the planets moved around the early solar system. And so the process of instability as I described early on, it's still not fully uh, well understood. So what I told you, it's what I think might be the case, but hopefully with the Lucy mission, we'll find out more about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the answer. And uh, the final comment uh, from Lorenzo Olguin is that uh, they have already took part on occultation observations of Patroclus Menutius system. Perfect. Thank you for doing that. And, <laughs> uh, and there will be more in the future. So keep, keep an eye on that opportunity. And we really use the data. The data is important to us because, it, as I said, it allows us to have a better understanding of the size of the object, of the relative position, in the case of Patroclus and Melanesius, of their relative orbit. So that is really data that is not just interesting from a scientific point of view, but it also allows us to have a better planning of the flyby. So it's really important to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we can uh, conclude here unless Antigona has a better opinion. <laughs> okay. So no. we, I think we can conclude here. And uh, uh, before giving the microphone to Antigona, I, I, I would like to thank again uh, Simone Marchi for this great talk and uh, accepting to give this great, great talk. And also to th thank the audience that follow this uh, conference through Facebook and YouTube. Um, please, Antigona, the microphone is yours. Thanks, Simone. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit in Spanish. Eh, muchas gracias a todas las personas que nos acompañaron. Este evento fue hecho gracias a un proyecto con ACID. Es el último evento de, bueno, de, de astrobiología para todos y todas. Eh, de este año vamos a tener nuestro Día de la Astrobiología el día 26 de noviembre 
eh, de este año, entonces eh, muy pronto les estaremos anunciando nuestros eventos, eh, tendremos en principio, les doy una probadita, tendremos a la doctora Luisa Falcón, que es experta en microbialitas, entonces les esperamos el viernes 26 de noviembre para el último evento del año de SOMA, que es el Día de la Astrobiología, y les agradecemos muchísimo su compañía en este evento el día de hoy. Hasta luego. Muchas gracias, Antígona. Gracias, Simone. Y aquí eh, finalizaré la transmisión en vivo eh, en YouTube y en Facebook. Muchas Thank gracias you. a todos. Thank you. Bye. Bye.